Welcome to the Three Martini Lunch. Grab a stool next to Greg Corumbus of Radio America and Jim Garrity of National Review. Three Martinis coming up. He's back. Jim Garrity on vacation last week, back this week, and then I'll be leaving on Friday. It's just kind of the way the beginning of summer vacations work around here at the Three Martini Lunch. But uh, glad to be back with you for at least the next four days here, uh, Jim. Hope you had a fun week uh, as you were on the road. Uh, it was a fun week, Greg. We, we're going to be like ships passing in the night this month. It is summer. Um, and for those who are confused, yes, I did write the morning jolt last week. It was my way. I, I just knew there was so much stuff going on with the lab leak stuff that I, I didn't want to be completely away from uh, the news world. But I was not taping the, the the three martini lunch. So if you're wondering, like, was is this Jim's way of like taking vacation days without taking vacation days? <laughs> <laughs> Say no more. Hey, how you guys count that uh, is totally up to you over at National Review. I can just picture yourself virtually kicking down Rich Lowry's door and saying, this is my story, Lowry. No one's covering it, even when I'm on vacation. <laughs> well, I also had this feel like the, the more, if I went through any hot spot that was, or, or any dead zone, like that's when somebody would defect and come out with a full confession. Or maybe that's happened leading into our first martini. Very nicely done, Jim. Yes, usually all the espionage nightmares go the uh, other way uh, as against the United States, but this time, it appears that a very high-ranking Chinese official has defected to the United States. Town Hall and Red State uh, with the story. I'm surprised this isn't getting more attention uh, from, from more media outlets. This is a huge deal. But uh, according to uh, Town Hall uh, and through Red State, they have confirmed through their sources that a vice minister of state security named Dong Jingwei defected in mid-February, flying from Hong Kong to the United States with his daughter. Uh, he was a longtime official in China's Ministry of State Security, uh, and his publicly available background indicates he was responsible for the ministry's counterintelligence efforts in China. And so uh, he is uh, allegedly and reportedly confirming that it was a lab leak, Jim, uh, and that the bats and everything else was just uh, a, a giant cover story for what uh, is now becoming clearer and clearer about what actually happened with the outbreak of the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, and there's a lot of other things, uh, even non-related to the pandemic, that uh, he apparently is divulging now to the Defense Intelligence Agency. Uh, other things, including names of U.S. citizens who provide intel to China, uh, names of Chinese spies working in the U.S. or attending U.S. universities, financial records showing U.S. businessmen and public officials who have received money from the Chinese government, details of meetings that the U.S. government officials had, perhaps unwittingly, with Chinese spies and members of Russia's SVR, uh, how the Chinese government gained access to a CIA communication system, leading to the death of dozens of Chinese people who were working uh, with the CIA. Oh, and they have terabytes upon terabytes of uh, dirt, basically, on uh, people working in our intelligence community and beyond, so they are potentially compromised. And they also have provided the DIA with copies of the contents of the hard drive on Hunter Biden's laptop. So, uh, Jim, this is uh, a lot of stuff in a lot of key areas. It'll be interesting to see how much the rest of the media covers this and what we actually can learn from all this. Yeah. So when we were talking about the topics for today's show, my my first thought is to characterize this as a mysterious martini. It's not good. I mean, like if, if 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 it turns out to be true, it is really good for the U.S. that we have this defector. What he's saying would be really bad news, and all of it seems kind of a little bit on the crazy side. I, my first thought, because I've had a couple of readers write in and say, Jim, what do you think of this? Is this true? What are you hearing anything? I've heard nothing from people who I know who are. Uh, plugged in in these worlds who may or may not be in a position to know about this sort of thing. If, if the U.S. did have this, obviously this would be an enormously huge secret. Obviously the Chinese would notice when they say, hey, um, has anybody seen Dong Jingwei around the office lately? Is he, <laughs> is he, he's not answering his phone? Anybody? You know, um, this would be very tough to keep under wraps in China. And you'd see the you know, reactions of the Chinese state security uh, for this. And this would just be a huge intelligence coup if it came to pass. I am a little bit wary when you start hearing detail. When all of the details line up just so perfectly, including the Hunter Biden laptop and all kind of stuff, that this, you know, the state security is like one part internal security and the, also the equivalent of their CIA. So it's not necessarily that they would know what's going on in the Wuhan Institute of Virology, or maybe they would. We've had, as I've discussed on previous podcasts, the uh, evidence suggesting that the Wuhan Institute of Virology worked with the Chinese uh, People's Liberation Army and, and the military in applications of biological warfare. 
So maybe Chinese state security would know about that. Or maybe Dong Jingwei is at a level where almost everything important to the Chinese government comes across his desk and he would know about this. Or maybe he was planning to defect and he decided that he wanted to collect as much valuable information as possible before he went over there to ensure a warm welcome from American citizens. This is the kind of story it's very tough to confirm because if we have him, we don't want the Chinese to know about this. Uh, the Chinese certainly would know whether he's missing or not, whether he is, is he no longer in the country. And if so, where did he and his daughter go? And they, you know, defecting to the United States would certainly be the most likely scenario and their nightmare scenario. He's not going to, you know, defect to some other country. Um, also, I assume that if the U.S. has him, we've probably got him in some sort of safe house deep and far and obscure. And that is the, you know, most closely held secret at the highest levels of our intelligence community. So here's the thing. I do the one probably the strongest argument in favor of this is we talked in a couple of podcasts ago, Greg, about the concept, Mickey Kaus and the concept of under news. Right. The idea of when you start seeing other people making unexpected changes in their opinion, or they start reacting to something without really specifically saying what it is, then it suggests that something is happening behind the scenes that we can't see, but that is clear that they have access to some information that makes them say, hmm. My previous position on this is untenable. Now I'm going to do this. It does seem like there's been this dramatic recalculation of public views of the, the lab leak theory. And I guess the thing that seemed to have set it off was that Wall Street Journal report about three researchers at the Wuhan Institute getting sick uh, in November 2019, which would be right around right before the uh, pandemic started in earnest in Wuhan. And that, that's a significant piece of information, but it just feels like everything from the Biden administration changing its attitude to the EU, to lots of other people saying we need a full investigation. It, it felt like it was a little bit of a, a very big swing for one report, which, oh, by the way, didn't really have a named source. So maybe this is it. Maybe within the highest levels of the US government, this guy's you know singing like a bird and telling us all kinds of stuff that's fascinating that kind of indicates, yes, this really was a lab leak. That might be the only way we would get 100% solid, you know, ir irrefutable evidence of this. Uh, we don't know what kind of papers or files or, or documents or, or other data he may have come with. Um, fascinating if it's true, but I would just tell everybody, just don't, if something seems too good to be true, be at least a little bit wary about it. I think it may be a long while before we actually get any confirmation as to the fate of uh, Deng Jingwei. Well, I doubt the Chinese are going to uh, say, yep, he's the guy and everything he's saying is true. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, he left. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and I doubt our government's going to be uh, confirming much either. So that might be one of the reasons why others aren't picking up on it. But, uh, you know, we always have these unnamed sources that uh, seem to pop up with uh, on other stories with no hesitation. So I have to assume there's at least a couple that are going to come out of the woodwork to uh, confirm one way or the other on these. So uh, we will see. But uh, and we'll see if every bullet point in that story ends up being true. But uh, like you said, uh, scary to think that they have that much stuff on us. Good to know that that we actually are aware of it. It's kind of like the old Don Rumsfeld, known unknowns and known knowns. And mm. important, important uh, story to follow here. And that's uh, one that could take a while to play out, but we will see. Anyway, let's uh, talk about some definite good news. And that is another way to take excellent care of your oral health. Look, there's brushing and there's flossing, but there's also the rinsing with the mouthwash. And you want something that's easy to use. You want something that tastes great, but you don't want it necessarily so intense it makes your eyeballs turn around in your head. And that is where Quip comes in with their brand new mouthwash that is a perfect complement to hopefully the toothbrush and the floss that you've already got from them. Now, what you want to think about with their refillable dispenser is that it has a compact footprint that will fit in any bathroom, big or small. It's got five colors, two high-end finishes to choose from, and you're guaranteed to find one that will match your personal style. Now, this is the one mouthwash you will not want to hide under the sink. Sitting on your counter, it is a beautiful reminder to rinse every day and a subtle way of letting all of your guests know that your oral care game is next level. We want next level oral care. Mouthwash is the perfect finishing touch to that oral care routine. Pair it with a Quip electric toothbrush for adults or kids and one of their refillable flossers. And you'll be surprised at how easy and fun it is to keep your whole mouth healthy. I've had a chance to test the mouthwash and the dispenser. Uh, it's pretty 
common sense uh, to set up. My wife is more mechanical than I am, so she, she did it anyway. Uh, but you just uh, push down. Uh, the dispenser fills up with the amount of mouthwash. You put it in a little cup. You add some water. Uh, and then you uh, you rinse. And it uh, is very refreshing, but not overly intense. And so if you go to getquip.com slash martini and the number five, martini five, right now, you can get $5 off a mouthwash starter kit. That's $5 off a mouthwash starter kit, which includes a refillable dispenser and a 90-dose supply of Quip's four times concentrated formula at getquip.com slash martini5. That's M-A-R-T-I-N-I and the number five. G-E-T-Q-U-I-P dot com slash martini5. Quip is the good habits company. All right, Jim, let's move on to our crazy martini. We have two crazy martinis today, but let's go to the first one. It involves Rhode Island Democratic Senator Sheldon Whitehouse. There's a lot of Democrats we don't take all that seriously in the U.S. Senate, and Sheldon Whitehouse may well be at the very top of that list. He is not one that uh, commands a great deal of respect. Uh, He's, of course, best known here on the Three Martini Lunch and in many other circles for spending his time quizzing Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh about yearbook jokes from 1982 and what boofing was and what all the F's meant. Uh, and he thought it was uh, something far more sinister than that about what he was doing to girls at various parties, because of course that was the allegation made against Brett Kavanaugh. But now Sheldon Whitehouse is a little bit on the defensive. He was uh, uh, confronted by a reporter in Rhode Island about an issue that uh, came up many, many years ago for him, and that's that he belonged to an all-white beach club in Rhode Island. And so the reporter decided to follow up on that. And, well, apparently not much has changed uh, since Sheldon Whitehouse has been elected to the Senate, which was, you know, back in 2006. Back in 2017, you had expressed concerns about the membership of the all-white Bailey's Beach Club, said that you hoped it would become more diverse. Now, your family's been members. Your wife is one of the largest shareholders. Has there been any traction in that? Are there any minority members of the club now? I think the people who are running the place are still working on that. I'm sorry it hasn't happened yet. Um, Do you have concerns in 2021? I mean, obviously, it's been four years. You had remarks on the floor following the deaths of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd saying, you know, hoping to root out systemic racism in the country. Um, Your thoughts on an elite, all-white, wealthy club, again, in this day and age, um, you know, should these clubs continue to exist? It's a long tradition in Rhode Island, and there are many of them. Uh, I think we just need to work our way through the issues. Thank you. It's a long tradition, Jim. You think that would work for a Republican senator? If we're talking about racial discrimination, a lot of things are long-standing traditions. And in many cases, that's the problem. Um, Greg, you and I have never been big fans of Sheldon White Club. And uh, his the, the thing I had the, the, the lead into the question I love there, where he point, the, the reporter points out that his wife is the largest shareholder in the club. Greg, who's this guy got to sleep with to get this policy changed? Seriously. <laughs> you, you know who has to, what he has to do to get the policy changed? He has to turn over in bed and say, honey, I think we should have some African Americans at the club. I mean, the other thing is also, it's Rhode Island. The entire state is practically coastline. If you're a senator, a Democratic senator in the era of Black Lives Matter, and you don't see any moral problem in being part of a private all white club, really? It is mind boggling. And I don't think I can understand if certainly, oh, um, he's only one senator. Et cetera. Let's face it. If this was a Republican senator, he would already be getting, uh, you know, portrayed as a Klansman. He'd already be getting portrayed as the worst of all, of worst possible racist as a, you know, the you know, keeping the, the spirit of segregation alive, et cetera, et cetera. All to be a membership in a beach club in a state that is almost entirely shoreline. It is absolutely flabbergasting, and it's a good demonstration of how, like, well, Sheldon White Club, pardon, White House. I mean, it, they're interchangeable, I suppose. Sheldon, by the way, just insert the entire when Harry met Sally routine about Sheldon right here. Now, Sheldon can do your taxes. There are certain things Sheldon can't do. But anyway, um, <laughs> right now Sheldon Richardson, the defensive lineman, is going to be pissed at me. Anyway, um, Sheldon White House is ridiculous. The fact that the national media, by and large, has not picked up on this and turned this into a crusade is also ridiculous because you'd like to think that of all the aspects of of discrimination and treating people differently based on the color of their skin, if there's any aspect of that which we think you could leave in the past, it would be private clubs that do not permit certain members based on the color of their skin. But it's no big deal. And the explanation from a Democratic senator is that, well, it's okay because it's a long tradition and he just needs to, quote, work our way through the issues, unquote. If only Sheldon White Club 
If only Sheldon Whitehouse was in someone who could do something about this. I'm sorry. If only he knew someone who could do something about this biblically. Oh, my goodness. And, you know, of course, if there was a Republican who uh, this was a fact about, you know, who'd be leading the histrionics on the Senate floor about how outrageous this is. Right. It would be him. It would be him. It would be people like Dick Durbin. Oh, the White Club. Yeah, or like Dick Durbin last week, who was you know comparing trying to kill the filibuster to storming Normandy. I mean, it, it's these people with their with their ludicrous uh, examples and their and their fake outrage who would be who would be all over this. Now it's it's possible that that no minorities in Rhode Island want to be part of this stupid beach club. Uh, but uh, you'd think if they were really making an effort over the last four years, for sure even longer, uh, as it turns out, uh, given the long-standing tradition, that if it was, a, it was a big priority, they probably would have convinced somebody to do it by now. But uh, anyway, hypocrisy, uh, hypocrisy knows no ends. And of course, there's hardly any media coverage about this. But uh, I remember when a House staffer, not only was the House staffer not well known, uh, but the member themselves wasn't well known. She tweeted something about what the Obama daughters were wearing at the Thanksgiving uh, pardoning of the turkey deal. And that was like a four or five day story all over the headlines. But uh, but Sheldon Whitehouse, no. Well, Jim, you mentioned the uh, the potential pillow talk in the White House residence. But uh, one thing that could, ah, that's a good segue. This is what they need to perhaps facilitate the conversation: more comfortable pillows. And that's where my pillow comes in. I love my pillow. Uh, I've been uh, using the my pillow for years. There's nothing like it. Uh, it's best for my head, my neck, my shoulders. And now my pillow is at its lowest price ever. Their current offer is that for a limited time, you can get a queen size premium my pillow for only $29.98, and a king-size pillow is just $5 more. Now, these premium pillows will never go flat, and they give you the best night's sleep every night. They're made right here in the United States. They have a 60-day money-back guarantee and a one-year limited warranty. So go to MyPillow.com and click on the radio listener square, enter the promo code MARTINI, or call 800-874-0104. Now, while you're there, please take advantage of the deep discounts on all MyPillow products, including the Giza Dream bed sheets and the new My Slippers. Get your premium MyPillow today for only $29.98, but you're only going to get it with our promo code MARTINI. So use it when you call 800-874-0104 or visit MyPillow.com today. All right, Jim, let's talk about our second and final crazy martini of the day. We go down to Florida, where, of course, Ron DeSantis, who is clearly standing out as a leading figure in Republican politics, uh, popular in Florida, and therefore the media hate him. We've uh, seen it for a long time now. Nothing he did uh, during the pandemic was right. But, of course, Andrew Cuomo... Uh, who really did just about everything wrong, was treated as the hero. But uh, the media can't let uh, Ron DeSantis be the good guy here. And in fact, sometimes he's got to be the bad guy when there's literally nothing he's had to do with the situation at all. And that's what happened in Florida over the weekend. Wilton Manors, Florida, just outside of Fort Lauderdale. Uh, Reporters and liberal activists, according to Fox News, quick to label a vehicular accident at a Florida Pride Parade as a terrorist attack. On Saturday, reports quickly emerged about a truck ramming into three participants of the Pride Parade. One individual was killed in the incident, while others were left seriously injured. Congresswoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz reportedly narrowly missed being hit while riding a convertible in the lineup. Fort Lauderdale Mayor Dean Trantalis uh, initially labeled the incident a terrorist attack on the LGBT community, as well as an attack on Congresswoman Schultz prior to any investigation. And so as soon as he labeled it a terrorist attack, the media is all over the place calling it a terrorist attack. Maggie Haberman at The New York Times, Democratic operatives everywhere. And then it immediately shifted to huge attacks on Governor DeSantis because, uh, like other states, Florida has been sympathetic to laws that you don't have to stop if violent protesters are getting in the way of your vehicle because your life could be in danger in addition to the property damage that's likely to occur. So you're allowed to keep going. And potentially, uh, if the protesters don't get out of the way in the middle of the road, they might get hurt. And of course, that's been uh, demonized uh, on the left. And so because this happened, well, it's got to be because of what Ron DeSantis did. It's emboldening bigots. And here we are. And then you've got this uh, uh, LGBT organization saying, no, it's actually just one of our guys. It was totally an accident. There was no malice intended. It's just a horrible thing that 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 happened. Uh, but this was not a terrorist attack. And so everybody's got egg on their face because they just had to jump to that conclusion. Yeah. So. Uh, I remember years and years ago, I went back and I actually, I've I, I looked it up. I found there's a New York Times uh, article, op-ed piece from, from 2010 that talked about 
you know, people who complain about sudden acceleration syndrome in their cars and the complaint that many of their cars, they believe were uh, defective, that, you know, they were in some sort of, they were driving and they're in some sort of situation where the, the driver is absolutely convinced they press the brake, but for some reason the car accelerated all by itself. And they've, you know, all kinds of engineers have looked at these and they've come to the conclusion and said, well, actually, no, this, what happened is your foot hit the accelerator. You thought you were hitting the brake, and you thought you're pressing it down on the brake as hard as you could, but you're pressing as hard on the accelerator as you can. And apparently in the vast majority of these cases, this what happens is simply driver error. It's really unfortunate when it happens. It's not, you know, uh, it's not intentional, but it's just one of those things where people, you know, they can't, they're not looking down into the foot well. They can't tell which one they're, do, they're doing. They, they panic, they get confused, hit the wrong thing, and a terrible, terrible accident occurs. That appears to be what happened in this one, or I guess there's some report saying that his foot got stuck under the pedal or something like that. There's no indication that this was terrorism. There's no indication that this was uh, targeting members of the gay community, that the guy was what part of the gay choir was, was the one who did it. It's not like he's been a sleeper agent for uh, all of this time. Now, you and I laugh about politics a lot on this program. We, we have a lot of fun and we, we chuckle. And we, we've, part of this is a, I would argue, healthily cynical viewpoint <laughs> that when a politician is caught chasing a secretary around the desk, there's usually some sense of there. We almost expect them to say, I was mentoring a troubled youth or I've always believed in promoting women or some sort of really unconvincing spin or something like that. But there are certain things you're not supposed to lie about. And something like this is not something you're supposed to lie about. Um, there is, as I said, there's never any evidence that this. I'm sure in the immediate moment of it, people were, were shocked and horrified. But there was nobody screaming Allah Akbar. There was no one screaming die, gays, die. There was no indication that this was a, a terror attack of any kind. It was a really unfortunate accident. And yet the mayor, who is so hyped up on, on rage steroids, so to speak, that they just felt the need to say this is, this is another case. And it reminded me of the Pulse nightclub shooting and the, the de degree to which how much there was this immediate debate about what Omar Mateen was doing and what his motivation was. And this, I believe there were banners who insisted that this was a side effect of Republican hate, even though there was really no indication that Omar Mateen was uh, that. And there was also this almost instant rumor that Omar Mateen was a self-hating gay man, gay man who had been already seen in other clubs and all that kind of stuff. Now, subsequent investigation made very, very clear. Omar Mateen was on the 911 call with police telling them, I am doing this on behalf of ISIS. I pledge myself to... Uh, I think it was al Baghdadi, right? So he's, he's basically saying, I am working, I am doing this on behalf of ISIS. And a huge chunk of our political spectrum said, hmm, is this because of Republicans? Is this because of anti-gay <laughs> attitudes in the Christian community? You know, there is such a determination to go to the pre-existing villain, the pre-existing narrative, that people ignore the fact that in this case, it was a really unfortunate accident. It's terrible that these things happen in life. There's no, there's no malevolence, there's no intent. And yet some people are determined to say, aha, the root cause of this is Ron DeSantis. It's utterly ridiculous. And I, you know, there's, there's this mentality taking, uh, taking root in a lot of folks on the right that this is going to get Ron DeSantis elected president someday. I don't know if that's going to shake out that way. But there definitely is this knee-jerk desire to attack him, uh, almost to the point of an irrational obsession in some corners of the media and the Democratic Party. Um, that certainly reminds people, a lot of people, of the obsession with Trump and that certainly is only going to make other folks on the right love him more because the more folks on the left attack Ron DeSantis in an unfair way. Ron DeSantis makes wrong decisions. I, I wrote a corner post pointing out why his policy on cruise ships doesn't make any sense. You want to ban vaccine passports all across the country or any other building, fine. But cruise, cruise ships are different. Ron DeSantis makes mistakes. There are fair areas to attack him. This ain't one of them. And it's kind of mind boggling that, uh, that you know, a Democratic elected official would be dumb enough to just basically make up a terror attack and blame Ron DeSantis for it instead of acknowledging what actually happened here, which is a really unfortunate accident. Jim, you may have already been on vacation when this happened, so I don't know if you had a chance to see it. But uh, Joe Biden uh, put out a statement on the five-year anniversary of the Pulse Club shooting, uh, talked about some of the issues uh, he's focused on as, uh, as it relates to that shooting. Uh, guess which issue never made it into the statement? He talked about guns. Talked about LGBT. Yeah, I'm sure, sure it would be anti-gay attitudes and guns, and you know, Islamist terrorism has nothing to do with it. Certainly, you know. yeah, right. I, Greg, the real problem is, if, if the problem is that just Joe Biden was in no position to do anything about it back then. <laughs> that's, that's right. If Seriously. only, if only he'd been in government. If only he could have done something. 
yeah, no mention of radical Islam, no mention of ISIS, nothing uh, in that uh, in that part of the state. Well, hey, Greg, he didn't have to mention ISIS because Trump destroyed him. <laughs> oh, that's true. And he can't mention that either. So, uh, you know, anyway, Jim, good to have you back. Uh, we'll see how many crazy martinis we pile up this week. Talk to you tomorrow. See you tomorrow, Greg. Jim Garrity, National Review. I'm Greg Corumbus, Radio America. Thanks so much for being with us today. Please do subscribe to the Three Martini Lunch if you don't already. Also, we'd be grateful if you told your friends about us. Also, very grateful for those five-star ratings and your kind reviews. Find us on those home devices. All you have to say is play Three Martini Lunch podcast. And find us on Twitter. He is at Jim Garrity. I'm at Dateline underscore DC. Have a great Monday. And please join us on Tuesday for the next Three Martini Lunch. In today's world, there's always something going on in the news, but don't worry, we're here to cover all the things. Consumer spending is up along with prices. Stores are using Pride Month and rainbows to make sales. And Biden meets with Vladimir Putin at the G7 Summit. Hey, it's the Chicks from the Chicks on the Right podcast. Download and subscribe to our daily podcast to hear us pick apart and pick on the news of the day. Politics to pop culture, nobody's safe, but it's all fun. Subscribe on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts.